Welcome everyone to this COS conversation on Zoom number 80, I think we're at by now. Uh, good morning or evening, wherever you are, or afternoon. Um, my name is Phil Alexander and I'm the convener and programmer of these events, these fantastic uh, transnational link-ups between different musicians and different aspects of Jewish music. Uh, today we've got uh, Jeff Janesco in conversation with Paul Shapiro um, and I'm going to introduce Jeff and then he will take it from there. Jeff Janesco is the curator of the Milken Archive of Jewish Music and a visiting researcher with the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at UCLA. He holds a PhD in ethnomusicology from UCLA, where he's taught courses on Jewish music and ethnomusicology. His dissertation there explored Jewish music and identity in the Radical Jewish Culture recording series on the Tzaddik label, which makes him eminently qualified to be talking to Paul today. In 2021, Oxford University Press published his essay, Curating the Virtual Museum, Public Facing Ethnomusicology and the Curationist Moment in the volume, Voices of the Field, Pathways in Public Ethnomusicology. Paul and Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Phil. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening for um, those of you who are joining us today. Thank you. It's uh, really a great honor for me to be able to introduce um, Paul Shapiro and to um, introduce uh, all of you to his music, for those of you who, who haven't had the uh, opportunity to hear it yet. Um, I first learned about Paul and his music when I was doing uh, research for that doctoral dissertation that Phil just mentioned. And I uh, just met him during the course of that, <coughs> of, of, of that research. I can actually still remember pretty vividly the first time I met him um, in person because it was the end of February, it was in New York City and it was for some reason really warm outside. So we actually sat outside at a coffee shop um, on the Lower East Side and did our interview there and Paul showed up <clears throat> dressed to the nines, you know, suit, tie, hair, um, all, all nicely done looking just ultra professional. Um, he said he had just, uh, you know, been in the studio all day. And I also remember that he, he seemed to know just about everybody who walked by us that day. So I have, was looking back through my transcript and I see, um, I you know, made a little note in the transcript every time he greeted somebody who happened to walk by. And I think <laughs> that happened um, many times over the course of that uh, uh, interview. But he um, he's always seemed to me just to kind of um, embody what I, uh, I, I think of as the a kind of quintessential cool, jazz musician and um i've always admired him for that and it also uh it seems to me that he doesn't really compromise this when um when he turns to making uh jewish music i think you'll hear today he brings a real integrity to this music that's very kind of true to his lived experience um both as a jewish individual and as a, a musician um, his bio is way too long to to um read in full he's worked with uh, many people uh, he's a band leader, he's a soloist, he's a, a sideman, he's a session player, um, and just really worked in lots of different genres and styles. So um, <clears throat> just really excited to introduce you to him today. And I'm going to do that um, in a slightly unorthodox way, I guess. I wanted to start off with uh, uh, by just listening to a piece of music. Um, and in the course of that, while we're, while we're listening, I want to share with you uh, a document that um, I, I teased those of you who were on here last week. I said this is probably one of the most important documents in the, um, in the canon of American Jewish music. So what I thought I would do is I'll, I'll start off by playing the piece of music, and then I'm going to show that document to you and um, allow you to just kind of consume that as you are listening to music. So give me one moment. So in terms of documents, you know, like you've got the sort of the, the Isaac Pinto prayer book from the, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue that came to the US in like 1765. You've got like <laughs> the, you know, the, the first union hymnal that shows up in uh, 1897. I think, and then you've got um, you've got the book of Shapiro, which is a uh, a cartoon biography, historical biography, um, graphic novella of sorts 
that really tells the history of um, Paul Shapiro, uh, subtitled A Tale of Rhythm and Jews. So I'm going to start off with uh, um, a piece of music from his latest Sadek album, and we'll go through the, um, the catalog in, <clears throat> in a moment. And then once it gets going, I've broken that cartoon up into three uh, sections, so it's a little bit easier to read. So I'll just go through those very slowly so you can kind of read through them as we listen to Asham Nim. <laughs>
I hope that was an okay way to start out our little uh, <clears throat> session here. I love that um, um, arrangement there and what you did with that, Paul. Um, I hope everyone got a chance to read the um, read the book of Shapiro, and I hope you enjoyed that. Why don't we sort of back up a little bit from where the um, from where the book of Shapiro started, Paul? Just maybe tell us a little about. Um, where you were grew up, where you grew up, um, you know, where you were born and grew up, what, what, what kind of upbringing you had. Well, thanks, Jeff. And uh, thanks for sharing that book of Shapiro. I, I was really fun to look at it again. Uh, I grew up in Long Island, Nassau County, the town of Westbury, and uh, was an interesting upbringing. My uh, dad was uh, from Montreal. And uh, he met my mother uh, at working, he was working for the United Nations. Uh, and they were both working there in 1947 when it first started. And uh, I grew up in Westbury, Long Island and uh, enjoyed things that kids do. Played baseball, played clarinet. I wanted to play saxophone in fourth grade, but they said you had to start on clarinet because that's the way it was those days. Or, I think maybe the teacher didn't want to teach saxophone. He just wanted to put 12 clarinetists in one room. Who knows? Uh, finally, in ninth grade, they started a little jazz band at school, you know, like a stage band, they called it, with four saxes, uh, you know, four trumpets, trombones, rhythm section, and clarinet wasn't included. So that's when I said to my parents, I said, I want to play the saxophone. So finally, I got to play the alto saxophone, and that's when it kind of clicked for me. I really enjoyed it, and I started to play it all the time, and I started to jam with people and play along with records and uh, really started to, you know, improve and uh, enjoy it. And so that's kind of uh, where the music all came from. And uh, along with that, there was a Jewish upbringing, too. We belonged to a uh, regular conservative synagogue. We weren't highly, uh, we didn't go every week, you know, but we went here and there. And of course my sisters were bat mitzvah and I had a bar mitzvah. And um, uh, it was really the music in the synagogue that I enjoyed. I had to go to Hebrew school like all the kids and we'd stare out the window at the rabbi's son playing baseball on his on his little property over there and we'd be like why can't i be out there playing baseball like that but we uh we struggled through it like everybody else but it was the music in in the synagogue that that stuck with me and that later i revisited it did you talk a little more about what some of that music was do you know like who the composers were did you was there a cantor there that was um yeah particularly well, memorable or? The, 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 this kind of became important uh, later. Uh, be one Saturday, my dad, when I was about 10, I already went to Hebrew school, as I said, but he, he sent me off to, to go to what they called junior congregation in those days. And uh, it was all kids with one uh, adult who kind of led us through the service. And it was shorter than the, the, the adult service. It was about an hour. And uh, I all of a sudden really enjoyed it because it was singing and it was the music and I, I enjoyed hearing those melodies and uh, I started to go and I became a leader and uh, I led services and I, I, I really learned the prayers that, that we did at that service for the, which was the Saturday morning uh, service, uh, the Nusach. I really, really learned those melodies. I sang them a lot and I, I really enjoyed it. And of course, it was just an oral thing. We'd learn by singing along with them and reading along in the Hebrew, but very much an oral tradition. And uh, what happened later was when I had the opportunity to make my own record for Zorn, I thought about what I'd like to do and I started playing a lot of these melodies that I had sung in 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 junior congregation and in, in regular congregation, and I played them on the saxophone, and that was the difference because I was playing them as a as a jazz musician, 
as an improviser, as a composer, and I was, you know, uh, listening to what was really happening in those melodies and dissecting where they went and when they were major, when they were minor, what they did here, what they did there, and I was seeing them all through the lens of a composer at that point. And that's when I started to reimagine them for a, a six piece jazz ensemble. And so that's what Midnight Minion was. Uh, there's the the song Malahacha Yam, which I always loved. And there's Eitz Chaim He, which was a special song for me because it, it's always reminiscent of my dad. He liked that song, uh, that melody very much. And um, I did the, the melody before the Haftorah, called it Haftorah Prelude, and the melody after the singing of Haftorah, called it Haftorah Postlude. I did an interesting piece called the Amida, uh, which is the Amida, but I did it kind of like Ornette Coleman might have done it with uh, a, a sort of a, you know, very moving, fluid uh, rhythm section and uh, three-part melody kind of stacked over it floating kind of like ornette coleman skies of america kind of thing and uh, anyway that was the beginning of of my sort of uh re-interest re-study recommitment to jewish music and at that point i was really an improvising jazz and r&b musician and uh, were, so that's where the two really came in together because you were <laughs> probably close to 20 years into a career by the time the first Sodic album comes out. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I had really, and you know, we have to, we have to recognize John Zorn who, who with his radical sure. Jewish culture, he, he really made it uh, cool for a lack of better word to call yourself Jewish and play Jewish music because it just wasn't cool before then. You know, and also nobody had really done anything particularly different with it. Uh, it was pretty much uh, the old klezmer music or, you know, standard cantorial. Nobody had, had done, you know, anything that was remotely like the rest of the Sadiq catalog uh, mm -hmm. that, that he really enabled us all to do and gave us the opportunity to uh, do Jewish music with our own uh, expertise and background that we developed at that point. And many were not, most of us were mid-career at that point because, uh, you know, we were contemporaries of John Zorn and we were all around in the eighties and we were playing all kinds of different music. And it was early in the early aughts that, that Sadiq really started to uh, produce a lot of records. And so, Many of us had already had, you know, uh, sort of a track record of career in uh, yeah. avant-garde music, jazz, R&B, whatever we did. Should we talk about that career for at least for a few minutes? Kind of let, <laughs> uh, you know, introduce people to some of the things um, you've done before. I know it seems like Foreign Legion was was a, yeah. a significant moment for you. Could you tell yeah. us a little about how that band formed and then let's play at least, you know, a little bit of a, a track yeah. from that. Uh, well, um, I came to New York and I was really uh, interested in playing jazz. And I also came up in, in the 60s and 70s. So I really liked funk and other pop music of its day. I wasn't, I love to play straight ahead, you know, jazz a la hard bop, Coltrane, Charlie Parker tunes, uh, Sonny Rollins, uh, all the greats that I loved, Yusef Latif, Rassam Roland Kirk, you know. But I also liked to play funk, and I also enjoyed hearing the kind of avant-garde music that was around at the time. Things were noisier, rock, you know, punk was very ascendant. And so I made a, you know, we, we my generation, we, we couldn't get gigs in Sweet Basil or Village Vanguard or uh any of the top jazz clubs in the day so our opportunities were really playing at uh rock clubs and uh that's where we could get a gig and uh do our thing so i created a band i called it foreign legion because it was a kind of a collective but with disparate elements and ideas so that's the foreign and the legion and uh I had two guitar players, one of whom is with us today, William Brown. And uh, I had no keyboard player because 
the keyboard players uh, to me at that time sounded too much like fusion and i didn't want it to sound like fusion i wanted it to be more like uh edgy and metallic uh as opposed to kind of smooth jazz which was you know we didn't want we didn't like that vibe at the time and mm -hmm. uh and then I had a bass player and a drummer, and um, and I had Stephen Bernstein and myself, Stephen playing trumpet, and uh, we already knew each other and were good friends, and uh, I really featured the 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 double voice of sax and trumpet was really the the main element of that band, and I wrote some pretty quirky little melodies, and we put it on top of a dance beat and you know funk beats and stuff, and uh, we had a we had a good run. We uh, really worked very hard and played a lot of great gigs. And we came out on a record with a bunch of other New York bands like us. Called, there was a band called Defunct and James White and the Blacks and, uh, uh, you know, several other bands like that. Uh, and uh, that was as far as we could get. <laughs> you know, the record companies yeah. were not really interested in what we were doing. Uh, they were all... Uh, there was there was disco and there was punk and uh, there was rap that was beginning. And so they weren't really interested in sort of uh, the kind of music that we were playing, which didn't particularly fit into any radio formats or people weren't buying on math, but people really enjoyed it. So uh, anyway, that that was what what I did throughout the uh, the 80s into the 90s. And then I started to get some recording work, which turned into something else. Can we can we check out a, at least a short short bit sure. of uh, while you were out? Sure. By Foreign Legion. So this is a um, this is a professionally made video that you guys did, right? Yes, 1984. All right. It's our roots, man. Yeah. <laughs> Lower East Side. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and what happened to that band? 
Well, just fizzled I, out of, over time. I kept it going till about 1993, and then I was doing a lot of uh, session work. I had that hit with Frankie Knuckles' whistle song on playing flute in 1991. <laughs> it went all over the world. It's it's still very very well known, and uh, and then uh, I, I ended up in a in the, the beginning of a band called the Brooklyn Funk Essential, which uh, was really also very well known and was you know burgeoning into the re real recording world rca records and it was a very interesting band and so i just said i'm gonna throw my lot in with these guys and uh let foreign legion slide for a while because i'd given it a lot and uh you know it was i was enjoying the fact that this was something that had some 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 life to it and uh there was an interest and there was people working on it that, you know, were in, in, in the recording world. And it, it, it was a sort of an all-star group. And I was like, well, this is a good, this is a good thing to do now. You know, we ended up going to Istanbul and playing a gig over there. And I said, Hey, we're going to Istanbul. We got to play a, a Turkish song. So I brought in this song, Uskadar that the band, and uh, I taught it to the band. We ended up going over and playing this in this uh, festival in Istanbul. And the next thing I know, they had us coming back for two weeks of recording uh, to to record with Turkish musicians, sort of uh, not unlike a Sadik project, you know, to combine mm -hmm. uh, Turkish music with uh, you know this kind of jazzy funk. It was called acid jazz at the time, uh, and. Uh, I, I, you know, I do think that that my bringing in that tune kind of set set the stage for them thinking, hey, this would be great. Let's let's make a com combination of, you know, American acid jazz and Turkish music. Anyway, so there was yeah. a lot of reasons to 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 do that and to let Foreign Legion go at that point. Uh, you, you know, uh, just time to move on. But once in a while, we play a gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's it's interesting you mentioned that because there's a tune and i can't think of it off the top of my head but there's a tune on the last uh sadic record where it sounds very much um there's there's some some uh pretty pronounced kind of turkish influence in there there's something that sounds very oh, much like a of yeah. the playing together yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think i know which way you maybe talk about halil uh yeah with piano saxophone yeah um because yeah. and and uh yeah we were definitely we were definitely going serious middle eastern there um maybe you could just give us a, a a very brief rundown of what the microscopic septet was we can listen to um just oh. a couple of minutes of something from that and then we can start digging into the soda catalog okay well the micros as as uh they were known uh <clears throat> was a, a really interesting band uh that started in probably 1979 or something and philip johnston was the uh, band leader and joel forrester played piano and the two of them wrote most of the music and it was four saxophones soprano alto tenor baritone and upright bass piano and drums and uh it was like a little big band but it really was kind of very old school and very modern at the same time it was very unique that way and and we also that band also played a lot of rock clubs because that was what was available and people enjoyed it you know no matter where we played because it was very interesting and fun music and you know one minute we'd be playing something like that sounded like a 30s swing arrangement and then all of a sudden we break into 16 bars of avant-garde wailing and going nuts but then it would smack right back to something really tight and so it was it was a, a real new york flavor that uh was quite unique and very popular and you know we we played some festivals uh in the states and in europe and made several records and they're still working philip lives in um australia now and uh, they they play sometimes uh, when he comes back to town, and sometimes I sit in with them. 
uh, I'm not technically a member now, you know, uh, but mm -hmm. that's a really was a, a, a great period. And I'll just say that I lived on Ludlow Street at the time. I, I was lucky enough to inherit the family piano. So we used to rehearse at my, at my apartment and it faced the street and picture an apartment with four saxophones, drums, piano, and acoustic bass, all playing, nothing plugged in. And you know, the neighborhood would just stop. The, the beatboxes, they'd turn them off and they'd sit on the stoop and listen to us rehearse. It was really funny because this was a wow. very, a, a pretty active street. You might say, it, it, you know, quote, yeah. unquote, you know, this was not exactly a mellow West Village, uh, uh, you know, neighborhood. It was pretty active Lower East Side, 1985, 86, 87, you know, but not, but that didn't matter. When we played, everybody chilled <laughs> and listened to the micros. Yeah, and we so let's um, check it. It was a really technical band as well. I mean, the, yes, uh, yes, a really tight band, very so. tight, very intricate passages, and people really enjoyed yeah. that. So I just want to play a couple of minutes of this performance sure, sure. that was um, taped for for VH1 here, and just note that the the sound seems to be a little bit low on it. So if you have trouble hearing it, um, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be much I can do about it, but. coming through enough yeah Let's see how skinny i was <laughs> Seems like just a super fun band to play in and just like nonstop. Yeah, it was it was it was really fun. I, I wrote I wrote a composition. I wrote some, you know, a couple of tunes for the band that they played once in a while. And one of them I wrote was called Dancing on the Corpus Colossum, which I thought was pronounced Colossum at the time because of the two the two parts of the brain. And, you know, we'd be dancing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you'd be in the middle of a hot solo and right at the end of the solo, you'd have to jump back into a riff that was written. So it was like, uh, it was a lot of, a lot of dancing between the right and the left hemisphere in that band. Yeah. And I understand this was, um, there's a, a Zorn connection there too, because he was the alto chair in that group. For, Zorn for was the original. You guys first... Well, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Zorn was the first, uh, alto player in that band. That's right. And there's even a record that he played on uh, that's that's available somewhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, I knew Zorn sometimes. I didn't really see him with the micros, but you know he was in that scene. And I remember we played a gig that he was on, and I, that was the time when Zorn had a whole table of stuff, and he would play a little saxophone, and then he'd he'd you know play a squawky duck sound on something and then he'd rattle something else and he it was really fascinating i mean he was always way ahead and uh but that is that is the the general scene that that uh i got to know john in because i was part of it and he was part of it yeah so let's start jumping into the um the sonic catalog a little bit more here cool. so you have 
uh, you've released four discs on um, on the Radical Jewish Culture series um, up to now, and I've got a list of those here. So spanning from 2003 to your most recent um, 2014. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about how Midnight Minion kind of came to be, and then we'll check out the um, the Haftorah play, prelude from that. Great, great. Uh, well, um, I think the first thing I did for Tzaddik was uh, Stephen Bernstein's Diaspora Soul record, which was his first record on Tzaddik. And Stephen and I, of course, were longtime compatriots already. You know, we go back to Foreign Legion and before Foreign Legion in a band called Sahib Sarbib Multinational Jazz Orchestra. <laughs> and uh, so I played on Stephen's record. Yeah. And then I Zorn called me to play on a record by uh, a wonderful, wonderkind saxophonist named Daniel Zamir. Oh, who that's a, a right. Yes, yeah, yeah. called Children of Israel. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Annette Cohen was uh, on on that record as well, playing saxophone. She was not yet the you know the famed clarinet player that mm -hmm. she is now. And um, uh, many, many really good musicians. It was very interesting orchestrated music. And so that was my second Sodic record. And then uh, I, I just uh, got into a discussion with Zorn and I said, hey, I'd like to make one. I have some ideas. And uh, he said, let's do it. And so then that's when I really uh, started to think about what Jewish melodies I might like to do. And I, of course, wrote some originals, uh, a tune called Lester Young's Misha Beirach and a tune called Fragish Behavior. Uh, I was referencing some of the modes that I was learning about in Jewish music. But I also went back to those melodies that I mentioned earlier that I learned uh, growing up, particularly um, the melody before the Haftorah was kind of the first one that I kind of really came up with an idea that I liked for this record. And it really came, as I said, from playing that melody on the saxophone. In other words, everybody knows, you know, how to sing that melody or doesn't, everybody doesn't know. But if you're a bar mitzvah kid, you learn Baruch so anyway, I was playing that on the saxophone, and then I started to do it. I said, you know, I just played it. Ba -ba -da 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 and I started to play it like a Latin jazz mambo, and the light went off and said, hmm, that's interesting. I'll tell you one more thing about the record, uh, that track sure. specifically. I wrote it out the way I heard it, and then I literally wrote it out, and I realized that the form was seven bars, two bars, and three bars, which was very unique because most songs are eight, 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 and 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 eight, you know, and maybe maybe uh -huh. a double eight or four here and there, but they're, everybody often adheres to structures of eight, you know, sections of eight. And I followed the melody and the way I wrote it out and conceived it for this, it was quite a unique form. And so when we improvised on it, I decided let's improvise on that form, which is challenging. And yeah. uh, we did a good job with it. It came out well. Uh, but if you listen carefully, you can hear that it's, it's a very odd uh, harmonic rhythm, you know, the, the way the chords are laid out and the way we improvise over the, the structure is different. Let's check it out.
Um, you mentioned Ornette Coleman earlier. Was he figuring into that arrangement? There oh, yeah. all, there's a real sense of that, that kind of overlapping collective improv going on there. Absolutely. I, yeah. I really, um, specifically when we, when we worked on the Amida, uh, I, I specifically had everybody improvising together and we were trying to emulate the sound of a synagogue praying the Shimona Esrei or the Amida, and that's a silent prayer, quote unquote, and yet everybody kind of comes in with the beginning of phrases and the ends of phrases and they mumble and, and there's a collective kind of mumble and prayer of people praying at different speeds and doing their own thing but they're doing it collectively and that's particularly what i was looking for in my version of the amida where um we were doing our own thing and coming in and out uh as we would if we were davening and uh so this piece has a lot of that too but mm -hmm. the idea does have some roots in in the amida uh and the fact that it's a, a synagogue that is praying together in a silent ish kind of way where everybody kind of moves in and out of actual vocalizing and just praying silently and so that's what particularly the last chorus of the improvisation on this you really really get that where everybody is not so active and they're kind of it kind of floats down a little bit and people mm -hmm. are kind of trickling in and out that's really that that concept is is particularly uh evident there it's, yeah I mean, you kind of tried to mimic the overall arc of that kind of experience there, exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah i like i like playing together you know uh sometimes it can be too much but the micros did that too you know uh it uh you want to get away from the traditional uh jazz format of play the head sax solo trumpet solo sax solo piano solo guitar you know bass solo drum solo blah 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 play the head at the end so sometimes we were looking at for different forms that uh did things differently and uh this way we sort of it was more of a collective sound well i appreciate you kind of walking us through how that <clears throat> how that particular piece kind of Came to be it sounds like that was one of the first melodies that you um you really kind of went to when you started was, thinking about was. this idea of of making a record and then on the next album you made a little bit more of a leap toward original music right is this yeah. album exclusively original shapiro compositions yes pretty much i, I think they were all oh, maybe was there one on that no it was mostly well zorn really liked my originals uh, particularly on 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 the Midnight Minion record, the Fragish Behavior and the uh, Lester Young's Misha Beirach, and he really uh, you know liked the originals, and so he told me to make a record and uh, do mostly originals. Yes, actually, on this one I did um, uh, Light Rolls Away the Darkness, which is kind of like Midnight Minion, and that it's it's a evening prayer it's a friday night prayer uh and most evenings i think it said uh umavir young who may be lila and that melody is not original to me it's a kind of a, an arrangement a la midnight minion but most of the others are, are original on that record yeah so how do you make that leap how does one kind of write original jewish music it was a challenge. I'm just from your perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a challenge, you know, because uh, uh, <clears throat> I was using some Jewish modalities, which is sort of famous in Sadiq, you know, um, sure. melodies that uh, uh, here's like everybody knows this one, you know. Uh,
That's the Fragish mode. Mm-hmm. This one is 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 this one puts that big interval in another place. This is the Misha Bayrock mode. Sorry. Anyway, uh, those those were some of the 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 things I used to get started, and uh, I, I sometimes used the 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 uh, lyric in 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 the case of uh, Lachado D. Lachado D was written in the 1500s by Shlomo Alkabetz, and uh, I it's a very famous um, poem that mm-hmm. many people have written melodies to for decades and years and millennium really and uh in that case i i i use the melody and i just put it over a, a kind of a funky groove that i liked i was actually just playing it on the piano and then all of a sudden i started to sing la Chodo d to it and that's how that happened and other ones came off the scales as i showed you a minute ago and um mm-hmm. Uh, I just, uh, you know, tried to think of of um, Jewish modalities and Jewish uh, lyric, and that's where it went. All right, should we listen to that? Sure.
nice. It was the same um, same group of musicians for both of those records. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. And you can hear Stephen Bernstein playing a great slide trumpet solo, mm -hmm. and then we're all singing. <clears throat> it's a whole band singing Lechado di Likrad Kala. And uh, we had a good time with that one. I've since written uh, verses to it because it, I was in a large, big band led by uh, saxophonist Greg Wall, who has since become a oh, rabbi. Sure. Yeah. And uh, Greg had a wonderful big band called the Ein Sof Orchestra. And we used mm -hmm. to play at a synagogue on East 6th Street. And uh, that was a, a interesting, nice, furtive period for a short while while he was there. He's in Connecticut now mm -hmm. at another congregation. Um, but we used to play that song in that big band. And I, you, you know, I wanted to write the verse because I was like, you know, we need the verse. This is growing. So, so we did that. People would sing along. It was the, that became uh, it really grew into uh, uh, a stronger tune with more to it. And the congregation would do a. Uh, a call and response like that i've yeah. done that in congregations yeah. i got everybody singing it's in the twilight nice. it's uh you know it's what it's yeah. bubbling under bubbling under we'll see <laughs> i don't know if it'll be the next <laughs> congregational hit but whenever it's done people really like it you know but there's a lot of lachado d's in the world so uh i don't know if that one's going to become a mainstream lachado d candidate but uh it, it is definitely enjoyed Definitely. Time will tell. Yeah. Um, so this led to your, your next sort of Jewish related project was doing a film score, correct? Yes, this was very, uh, was... very exciting. Uh, I, I did the score. I was commissioned by the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Lower Manhattan to do a score and play alongside the film which is a great tradition that uh, is getting more and more popular because some of these old silence were really, really fun. And this is, I love this movie. Uh, I know it very, very well, as you can imagine, because I spent many hours uh, studying it and figuring out how it was structured. And I had nothing to go on but the movie. There was no notes or any kind of uh, information about it other than the movie. So they, they commissioned me to do it, and I decided to do it with myself on various woodwinds and my favorite trumpet player in the world, Stephen Bernstein, and uh, a cellist, and upright bass, piano, and drums. And uh, I have the whole thing scored out, it's 91 minutes of music. Of course, there's a lot of improvisation, but... Mm -hmm. Everything was completely understood. There was no kind of uh, flopping around, what do we do now stuff. And uh, we've since performed this uh, uh, internationally. We played it uh, alongside it in uh, Krakow at the Jewish Culture Festival. We played it for the San Francisco Jazz Festival. Oh, nice. Uh, and we played it in Denver. We played it in um, uh, San Diego. We played it several times in New York uh, at a couple of times at the Museum of Eldred Street, the Eldred Street Synagogue, mm -hmm. which is so exciting to play it there because that synagogue was around when this movie was filmed. And so people get to go and sit in an, in an old synagogue in the Lower East Side and watch a movie about the Lower East Side, you know, of yeah. 19 and change. It was do, you, do, you know, do you know when this film was released? It was released in 1925, okay. but uh, I, I think it it you know it's it's from that era. You know, it could mm -hmm. it could be it could have been made with an eye to maybe 15 years prior. Maybe maybe it looks more like 2000. I mean, like one you know 1905 or 1910. But it was made in 1925, and it was just before sound came in. So uh, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, well-made film with uh, a lot of uh, 
scenes with many people in it and it would it has a boxing theme uh there's a it's a mom and dad and two sons one is the goody goody lawyer and the other is the one who is secretly a boxer and uh in love with the irish girl next door and i'm not gonna tell you any more of it because you should come oh, see the movie. Okay. So really apropos of the period then so. yeah okay. but uh my drummer really uh play the heck out of the boxing scenes you know because he really got to know them and he'd he'd play as we're watching and when the guy gets decked boom he's got that boom and he's got the rat -ta 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 punches and uh it's 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 uh we've had a lot of fun with this and uh it you know every so often it happens again fun film so we're just gonna play like the first two minutes of it here let me just let me just explain that, that yeah this is my sound uh this is my sound um laid in it doesn't exist other than this little uh version that i made of the first uh you know 13 minutes but I we're see. just going to do a couple okay <laughs> like a fun project <laughs> yeah very yeah. very fun i really love that and uh we have a good time when we play it too and then in the in the midst of all this you start another uh another group that's called ribs and brisket review another great uh <laughs> another great name Do you want to tell us a little bit how that that group came about and lead us into this next example yeah well um a friend of mine um, who uh, was uh, uh, a member of Foreign Legion in the later days, Valerie Ghent, wonderful keyboard player and singer songwriter, uh, she was booking the Cornelia Street Cafe for a little while. And so she called me up and she offered me a gig. And I was like, well, I don't really want to do Midnight Minion there. And so then I had this idea to do uh, something with vocalists. and. I always loved the sort of Louis Jordan-esque early R&B, pre-R&B really, uh, jazz swing, but with a backbeat and with humor and danceable. And I just love this kind of music. And so I'd always been a fan of it. And then I started to get into it more when I started to have these records on Sadek. I, I, I started to delve more into Jewish music and uh, Jewish music of all types. And I found that there was many uh, pieces of music and recordings that were made often by jazz musicians, by African-American singers of Jewish themes and Jewish songs. Cab Calloway had several. And so I said, this will be fun. I'm going to do a sort of a, a combination of Jewish and jazz rooted music with vocalists. And um, I had always been working with uh, Scylla Owens. And um, so I, I gave one night to her 
And then my uh, a very dear friend of mine who has since passed uh, named Bobby Floyd was another great vocalist. He had toured with the Stones and played with Keith Richards and backed up everybody famous you could ever imagine. Uh, and he was just a spectacular singer. And so I gave him a night. And then I just realized, I said, these guys are both so great. I got to put them together. And so that was the essence of what became the Ribs and Brisket Review, which has uh, a sort of a ribs being African-American, brisket mm -hmm. being Jewish, R and B, rhythm and blues. And uh, so that's where we went with that. And we did Cap Calloway stuff and we did Slim Gaylord was a, a great jazz musician with a great sense of humor who wrote songs about food. Uh, he wrote uh, Dunkin' Bagel and Matzo Balls and he had a tune called Meshuggah Mambo. He actually did a tune, a completely different lyrics to the melody of Oifen Pripachik. And- uh, Oh, really? Yeah, and that is hard oh. to find. I forget the name of the uh, the name of it, but it's it's Stone Cold Oifen Pripachik. Ya da 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 da, ya da 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 mm -hmm. da. It's a Slim Gaylord tune, you know, I mean, that he, that he um, uh, had on one of his records. And uh, so that was really fun. And that turned into be my third record on, uh, on, on Zorn's label. And it was pretty unique for John to do a record with uh, vocals because most yeah. of the records were instrumental. Mm -hmm. But we did it. And uh, one of the tunes that we did that became the name of the record is Essen, which was a, a famous Catskills tune that goes through the whole the whole menu, because those Catskill hotels, the mountains up in the mountains, as it was known, were famous for their huge amounts of food. And, mm -hmm. you know, orange juice, tomato juice and grapefruit juice and apple juice, baked apple stewed poons, pickle hair and pickle lock, smoked salmon fried, you know, blah, 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 blah. They'd go through the whole litany of it until, the, till, you know, they were so sick they couldn't eat anymore. And it's a very funny song. So we did that one and it became the album title. And uh, it's an interesting project, to say the least, because people would come up and recommend things to us. Uh, they'd say, you guys should do Essen. Or have you ever heard the tune, Cohen owes me $97 by Irving Berlin? You know, mm -hmm. and, and it was fun. You know, we did a tune. My, my, my singer, Scylla, who is African-American, brought in a tune called Yes, My Darling Daughter. She thought it would sound great with the band. And she had heard a version of it uh, by a, a singer named Adelaide Hall, who worked with Duke Ellington and worked with Fats Waller. And we brought it in and it was it worked perfectly for the band. And so we started playing it. And then somebody from the audience comes up and says, you know, the real name of that is Ya Mein Teure Tochter, which means, yes, my darling daughter in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, the tune has, has Yiddish roots. It was originally in Yiddish. And then we played it at the National Yiddish Book Center, and somebody came up and said, you know, that was really a Ukrainian folk song first, you know? Mm. And this is all true, man. Mm -hmm. Then we were playing it, mm -hmm. we're playing it at the Cornelia Street Cafe, and Janusz Makush, who runs the Jewish Culture Festival in Krakow, was in town. And he hears it, and he gets weepy. He said, we used to sing that song in third grade. So it's it's just hysterical. These tunes, man, what a life they've had. But uh, it, it, it's been an interesting uh, part of of that band. Uh, the the feedback we've gotten from people in the audience, you know, recommending tunes and telling us stories about tunes. And I knew Cab Calloway and I, mm -hmm. you know, it's really mm -hmm. interesting. It's been great. Yeah. No small shoes to fill either. Man. Oh, boy. Well, Bobby Floyd, Bobby Floyd was an amazing singer and he, he, he did a great, he did a great, you know, version of, of, uh, Otazoi where he chants, uh, mm -hmm. sort of like a, a cantor, you know, it's really, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let's check out a tune from that. And then just, I guess, so the, the group knows we've got this song, we'll do one more tune and then we'll open it up for a little Q and A. Cause I know nice. it's, um, um, we've been, we've been talking for a while here, so. Very this good. is Oy Vesmir. Oy Vesmir, Meshuggah Yiddish, 
Yiddish cup. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey vey is mimi. Oy vey vey is mimi. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey vey is mimi. Oy vey vey is mimi. Gate cracking up in yam. Bees take a stook in the ocean. Forgot the mist for stinking up. So this is your mama lotion. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey is mimi sugar. Yiddish cup. Oy vey vey is mimi. Oy vey vey is mimi. kind of move us along a little bit here before it gets uh, too late we're kind of coming full circle I think in some ways because your your first album begins a lot with liturgical music that you grow up with and then for your most recent album you went heavy liturgical right you turned to you turned to the the liturgy for the high holy days the yep. uh, Shamnu yep. track that we played from the beginning was based on uh, the Slichot liturgy, I believe. Right. Uh, traditional conservative tune for that. And um, so I, I'm going to ask you to introduce this by way of a question, um, which has to do with, well, maybe I'll ask it in a very straightforward way. Do you find spiritual parallels between playing 
jazz and playing Jewish liturgical music? And how did you bring those together for this, uh, this final album? Well, you know, music is kind of like religion to us musicians. It, it's a spiritual practice. You know, we, we feel it on many levels. Uh, it's not just moving our fingers around and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's a special quality that happens when we perform. It's kind of our way of praying, you know? And so I think it is heightened when I play Jewish melodies uh, or melodies that come from Jewish sonorities, which this Halil very much is. Uh, I think it may resonate a little deeper in me. It 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 feels very directly related to 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 my roots as a Jewish person, uh, and there may be a little more uh, personal involvement in in that performance because of a little bit more Jewish elements which make it a little more meaningful to me uh as as a jewish person i think that there, there, there is a little bit there is a, another aspect that happens when i perform jewish music not just as much as i love performing music and how it's kind of like prayerful to us as musicians when I'm playing with, you know, Jewish themes and Jewish sonorities, I, I think there's another level that it gets to me. I think it means a little bit more to me. Great. Um, so let's listen to Halil, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. Did you want to say anything about this tune at all before I play it, or just? Um, well, the Halil was an ancient. <laughs> Uh, instrument in Israel, and and it had, uh, it had that wide interval in it, da da da, you know that step and a half interval, mm -hmm. basically in where the holes were on the instrument. We're talking about a, a kind of a primitive instrument here, it wasn't any you know metal keys or side keys or anything, and I think that that scale became very popular. This is among some of the things I've read. This is one of the um, theories. And uh, that that Halil had a lot to do. There was something called an aulos in, in Greece at the time. And it became very popular uh, music, especially for uh, celebrations and sometimes for funerals. It was very evocative, that uh, that scale, and I think that it, it it may have had a lot to do with the the Middle Eastern scales that um, we recognize as such today. So this is a little bit of an homage to the Halil, that instrument. All right.
So that concludes uh, my little journey through <laughs> through uh, the music of uh, Paul Shapiro. I just want to point one thing out that, that Paul mentioned to me the other day when we were talking was for that that final album, Show for Oat, versus the first time. Um, well, the first time anybody in that band played that music was the day you walked into the studio, right? Yes. Yeah. Which is which is not unheard of, but still pretty astounding. I mean, yeah, really. Well, I've gotten uh, I've gotten better at creating very legible charts, and I use musicians that are very skilled, <clears throat> and. Um, money being what it is and time being what it is we were on a budget and so i didn't have the luxury of having you know many rehearsals but i also really like what happens when people play music for the first time because then you really get that real freshness and several of the cuts on that record were uh first takes because that's when it's really you're you know the the first impression is really effective i mean i just love listening to mark rebo what he played on that that last track i mean he's just such a great guitar player and um we uh i think i i prepared well and i also hired fantastic musicians and sure enough we'd go over the tune a little bit beforehand not even play it through sometimes go over it a little bit figure out an ending take it <laughs> and record it yeah you know? And yeah. uh, that is really a uh, uh, very challenging, but but very exciting, because uh, part of the whole jazz experience is is improvisation, and once you've improvised on something, it's very hard to improvise on it again without referencing in your mind what you just did on it. Sure. So it's very hard to maintain real freshness after you've done something because it's always somewhat informed by what you just did it's like oh i like yeah. that I'm, gonna, I, I'm thinking like that that was a good thing i'm going to do use that again and so then you get into uh, a, a conundrum where you're you're kind of not as in the moment because you're in the last moment as well so there's a lot of freshness on that record and it also being four musicians kept it pretty simple you know bass drums guitar and myself so um mm -hmm. when you have a, a small group of people you can be very fluid and sometimes uh there's less opportunity for getting uh sidetracked all right we looks like we have a question from agnes go ahead agnes Am I unmuted now? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm afraid I was 20 minutes late through no my fault of, of, of my own. But from that point on, this was great fun. So thank you very so much. I've got two questions and, and one comment. Um, well, the first question is, that's quite ignorant, but it's still my question. You mentioned that in for your silent film, you use the bass upright piano, or I think that's what you said. And if that's what you said, or did you say a bass and an upright piano? I'm a, <laughs> bit, I'm a bit confused. What is a bass upright piano? So yeah, uh, I probably said uh, upright bass, meaning. Yes. Uh, an upright bass, yeah, a bass fiddle, and okay. and an acoustic piano. Yeah, so you didn't use, you didn't use the word acoustic piano. So these words were all in one go, and I wasn't sure what you meant. But thank you now for yeah. explaining that. The second question is that some of your music appeared in synagogues, as you said, and I'm just wondering what type of synagogues because i know synagogues where you can't even have an organ yeah and so how how did you go about that and which were the synagogues which were tolerant and and progressive enough to interesting let your music in yeah 
Well, if we were, that's a very good question. If we were performing this music uh, during the service, then that would always be a reform synagogue. But I've played for Orthodox synagogues as well, but then we would often perform after the Sabbath was over, or we would perform uh, on a non-Sabbath day, like a Sunday concert or, uh, you know, a weeknight concert. So there's two separate approaches. One is to actually have music and have performance during the service, which is very exciting and wonderful. But that's only in reform. Sometimes conservative our, uh, synagogues are starting to get there. They're starting to loosen up the uh, instrumental music uh, restriction. But mostly reform temple. But I've also, you know, uh, people I, I've played for Orthodox uh, congregations and, and, and educational institutions, but they, that would always be at a uh, non-Shabbat time. Okay, and um, thank you for so much for that. And um, am I allowed my comment and then I shut up? Can I make my comment? Yes. Okay, well, it's a bit of an arrogant comment and I announced this comment on this forum, I think once every two months or so. I don't know if anybody believes me, but you know the mode which you played on your flute, which you said it's a freakish Phrygian, and it goes like la 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 Well, um, I wish that the wonderful Jewish people to whom I belong wouldn't keep saying it's a Jewish mode because um, it's one of the two Hungarian gypsy modes. Yes. Also, also it appears among the 113 Arabic modes. Yes. <laughs> So it appears in Romania modes, and so so I can't resist uh, mentioning this whenever on this forum, and wonderful people and wonderful scholars announce that this is a Jewish mode. It's it's a mode which has been used all over the place, and Bartok, in particular, um, commented that isn't it interesting that you get this kind of modes everywhere from Romania all the way to the Sahara and Arabic lands. Anyway, I'm going to shut up. Thank you. for. No, no, day. no. That's that's really great. And, and I, 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 I well taken. And I know it as the Ahava Rabba uh, uh, mode in, in Arabic. And you're right. I mean, when I spoke about the Halil, the instrument, I, I noted that it was available uh, as an aulos in Greece. And this is you're you're absolutely right. This is not a strictly Jewish mode. But uh, to Jewish people, sometimes we recognize it as the melody of Hava Nagila, and it's it's it sounds very Jewish to us. But you're absolutely right; it's 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 all over, and uh, it it you know may it probably has its roots in the Middle East and North Africa, and yeah. not specifically only Jews by any means. So that's well taken. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your comment. Thank, thank you for you. Thank you for your tolerance. So basically this mode unites us all, or it should. It should. Well yes. said. I'm with you. Yes. Thank I'm with you, you. so much. Much appreciated. Any other questions? Comments? Accolades? <laughs> I enjoyed, uh, I'm just reading this one uh, from Rachel Edelstein, who had to go. She says, I'm coordinating Shabbat Grand Central for my shul. And those emails to the bridegroom and the bar mitzvah boy aren't going to write themselves. <laughs> She's got to get to work. Well, you never know. Yeah. Maybe they'll be singing uh, one of the melodies from, from this program one of these days. Ellen, have a, has a question? Go ahead. I just... Uh a comment um, that um, uh, Paul, uh, you may or may not remember, I, I'm an uh, East End Temple uh, member. Yes, I, yes, I, 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 I recognize you, and yeah. I know you're, you're Jordan's wife, right? Uh, mother. 
Oh, mother. That's mother, right. Mother. Yeah. Um, but Good mistake. <laughs> I, I'm going to remember that. Um, <laughs> but, Don't tell him I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I come to you from um, a, a sort of the, well, from the workman circle world from Adrian Cooper. You may remember who. Of so, course, um, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, who uh, introduced me to your album? Oh, just months before she died, actually. You told me this. Now I remember. Yes. We spoke about this. Now I remember. Yeah. yeah. So this is a real um, eye opener for me, and just wonderful. First of all, the music is music is beyond. I mean, it's just spectacular. I'm. I'm. Thank you so I'm, much away you're welcome we try we try i hope you succeed um and now i forgot the rest of it so it, that's that's good enough and adrian thank you. cooper you were talking about adrian cooper well, i'm talking about I, it, this expanded my um horizons around jewish music and and jazz it, it, this is just amazing so thank that's you great. this is going to lead me to new places that's good. Well, you know, there's uh, there's a tremendous amount of um, of new Jewish music being made, and uh, it's not it's not all klezmer. We're part of it, and and we're coming from uh, other places, you know, like jazz and R and B and all kinds of music. So it, we keep it fresh. You know, it's good to have a lot of different voices. Uh, it's a good metaphor for uh, life and. Um, um, embracing differences. Oh, it's so it's we're 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 so far behind where we should be in terms of of embracing difference. It's just gotten we've just gone down this rabbit hole where we're back a hundred years as a as a human race. Yeah, that's for sure. Does anyone else want to ask a question? Or thanks for bringing it all together, Paul. <laughs> well, thanks for being you, man. You and I go way back, and it was good to see you playing while you were out. On the show. Yeah, I was playing along with some of your tunes here too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love your backdrop, William. I know that it's fake, but it looks great. Well, it's a real. Uh, bamboo forest where they for sustainability they grow the trees in, in, like bonsai style on top of each other and then they harvest just the top and then grow it again only you <laughs> well maybe i'll ask one um final question and then um uh, maybe i'll let phil close us out for the day um so you've been around you know the scene I guess you started your career in the early 80s, kind of the Klezmer revival is just getting started. You are, you know, you were involved with the the whole radical Jewish culture phenomenon. You know, you were around when that was was starting and then became involved in it probably 10 years later. Just looking back from your vantage point now, what have you seen change uh, or not change, you know, over the over the course of that time? Well, it's pretty fascinating. I mean. <clears throat> there is a tremendous revival in interest in Yiddish culture and more and more people, more and more student age uh, people are learning to speak Yiddish, are studying uh, the uh, literature written in Yiddish and speaking it. That's fascinating. And the Klezmer revival has gone through many great permutations uh, on from Frank London, my dear friends, Klezmatics, on through. There's just new Klezmer being made, and there's also a tremendous rediscovering of of uh, Klezmer music that was lost for for you know 80 years. That people are pulling out of trunks and you know finding great old field recordings made, and so there's all kinds of. Uh, of, of new things happening with Yiddish and with Klezmer. 
And we're part of that too, with our combining of jazz and uh, world music uh, with Jewish music. Uh, that's very exciting. I think that the most interesting things that I'm finding are people that are combining disparate or seemingly disparate elements and showing how unified they can be. And all of us, you know, need to enjoy and share God's green earth. And uh, it's not just us and them. And uh, I, I think that that, that I, I feel is, is, is the brightest light of what's going forward is uh, people that are, are really uh, combining world music and music of, 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 of their background with music of somebody else's background and how really realizing that the ties that bind us together and the commonality rather than our distinctive difference. So I'd say that that's, the, that's to me the brightest light of what's going on. You're here. Well, I just can't thank you enough for spending a couple hours with us today. And um, it was truly my pleasure sharing your music and sharing your thoughts. It's been, thank it's you been for really the comment. fun for me to reconnect with you after it's probably been 10 years since I've, I've seen you. Um, yeah. Time for another coffee outside. Yeah. <laughs> All my friends have left the neighborhood, so I don't know everybody anymore. <laughs> <laughs> any final words phil um yeah if there's no other questions i just once again likewise echo huge thanks to both paul and jeff for um uh fantastic music of course but fantastic conversation and uh a really excellent powerpoint as well there jeff so thank you for that <laughs> very yeah. slick um <laughs> bit of uh that of uh, presenting there. Um, beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, we were a small but very engaged group today. Uh, this is recorded um, and it'll go up on our channel. So if you've got friends or colleagues or anyone who you think would benefit from hearing more about this music and hear more from Paul, uh, you know, generally, then uh, please do share this. And thanks ever so much to, to both of you. and to Thank you all for coming. Much. Thank you for having us all. It's great. Thanks very much. Take indeed. care, everybody. Take care, everyone.